Hello, I'm Steve Dahl for the Ormond Beach Historical Society. I've lived in Ormond Beach for over 60 years now. I started school in Ormond as a fifth grader at Corbin Avenue School, built in 1917 and still serving the community as Ormond Beach Elementary. I've changed a lot since then and so has Ormond Beach. I grew up with these fascinating stories of old Indian mounds and plantation ruins and graveyards back in the woods in this area. And over the years I've come to find out that most of these stories are true. I've also learned that those few decades of change that I've seen only scratch the surface of the rich history of the Ormond Beach area. The stories of the people who also made their homes here and the events that made Ormond Beach the uniquely historic place it is today. Events that go back, well, that go back to the days when the pyramids were new. A lot of people know of Ormond Beach as a playground for wealthy northerners who came south around the late 1800s and early 1900s to escape the harsh winters and enjoy the natural beauty, mild climate, white sand beaches, and the amenities offered by that grand lady, the Hotel Ormond, which stood right across the Halifax River on the site of the present day heritage condominiums. Some of these visitors, like racing pioneers Barney Oldfield and Malcolm Campbell, saw a great potential in those wide white sand beaches, which offered a perfect platform for testing out their race cars. They stored and serviced them at the nearby Ormond Garage, built in 1904, and they went faster than any wheeled vehicles had ever traveled. Well, most of them did. They set the stage for what would become the stock car racing capital of the world, Daytona International Speedway. So, Ormond Beach, where it all started, became known as the birthplace of speed. Also among these visitors was Henry Flagler, who built the Florida East Coast Railroad that eventually carried passengers from New York all the way down to Key West. Flagler was so taken with the area and the potential of the hotel that he purchased it from its original owners in 1888 and added new amenities and almost 400 rooms to it, making it the largest wooden structure in the country at that time. Someone else who found a new home in Ormond Beach was John D. Rockefeller, who, with Flagler, founded Standard Oil. Neighbor John, as he came to be called, rented an entire floor of Hotel Ormond for several winters on the advice of his doctor to escape the pollution of the big city. In 1918, he bought the house across the street, where he lived out the rest of his days. So let's take a ride across the Halifax to see where neighbor John called home. This is the casements, the final home of John D. Rockefeller. The building has been beautifully restored to its glory days and is administered by the Casements Guild, which regularly opens its doors to the public throughout the year, especially during the holiday season. And across Riverside Drive is Rockefeller Gardens, now part of the Ormond Beach Park System and a popular venue for a variety of community activities. Just south of the Casements along Riverside Drive was Bosarvi, the home of the Bostrom family another one of the pioneer families of Ormond Beach. Now, if you'll follow me under the Ormond Bridge, and we come to the cupola, which is the last surviving piece of the Grand Hotel Ormond, which was demolished in 1992, after over a hundred years of service. This is the cupola that stood at the top of the hotel where guests were treated to a bird's eye view of the Atlantic. Pioneer settlers John Anderson and Joseph Price bought the half mile of property to stretch from the river to the Atlantic and is still home to the Oceanside Golf and Country Club for the grand sum of $125. And a short walk from here is the historic Nathan Cobb House, 
which was constructed from timbers recovered from the ship by that name that ran aground near here in 1905. The Cobb House is one of many sites that can be visited during a leisurely one mile walk from the cupola. A downloadable guide is made available through Florida Humanities and a print version is available at the Historical Society office at the McDonald House, one of the sites on the tour. But there's more, much more, to the story of this area that goes much further back along the timeline. Back beyond when the little retirement community for employees of the Corbin Lock Company, known as New Britain, served as the embryo for the thriving city now known as Ormond Beach. Back, in fact, over more than 5,000 years of human occupation. So let's take a little trip down the road and back in time to when the first settlers in the area made their homes along the banks of the river called Tomoka. We're here in Tomoka State Park at what is known as the Tomoka Mound Complex. It's one of the features in the Historical Society's schedule of tours available to the community throughout the year. We're here with park manager Philip Rand, who's going to brief us a little bit about what went on with these mounds. So Phil, exactly how many mounds have been researched so far? Well, um, first of all, the Tomoka Mound Complex used to be known as Ten Mounds, but Dr. John Indonino, doing some research here from Eastern Kentucky University, uh, has now found two more. So there's 12 mounds that are in this Tomoka Mound Complex. And Dr. Indonino um, finished doing about 35 test areas throughout the whole mound complex to get a good idea and sample of what's here and what the usage were, what did they eat. He did um, some new kind of studies about the seeds that were here and the food that was uh, that they found in the, uh, in the implements in the mounds. Great. Now, how old are these mounds and exactly what were they used for? Um, the mounds, most of them date around 4,900 to 4,600 years ago. I believe there's one, the oldest one is 5,000 years old. There's a couple that were put in a couple thousand years ago later, which is kind of unusual. Uh, they might, they may have come from the Nokoroko area. So these mounds, which is kind of unusual, were predominantly burial mounds. So they uh, have burials in almost all of them. Um, below the surface, they have sand coverings over the burials. Well, that's a lot of history and a lot of prehistory. I want to thank you, Phil, for this uh, information you've shared with us on this fascinating piece of the Mormon backstory. Well, thank you for coming out and showing the interest. And I just want to say one of the most neatest things, if anyone gets to come on a mound tour, is the studies showed that all the trees that were here when these mounds were made are here today. So if you want to see not just the mounds, but what it looked like, you're, you're seeing it. There were oak trees, red bay trees, there were hickory trees, cedar trees, which is what is here today, which also makes it an extra interesting tour to take. Well, we're certainly looking forward to seeing you at the next tour. Thanks. Thanks. Now let's move on to another area of the park where these mound builders, some of them, built their own houses. This is the site of Nokoroko, believed to be the second largest Timucan settlement on the Florida Peninsula. The Timuca were not a tribe as we understand it, but a number of Native American communities across North Florida who shared the same language and culture. We know of them through the records left by early European explorers who visited their villages. Once the Tumuka numbered in the tens of thousands, but through attrition, disease, and tribal conflicts, they had all but disappeared by the late 1700s.
But where the Timucans had vanished, a new generation of settlers stepped in. This was the birth of the plantation era, and it started here with the plantation of Richard Oswald in 1768. Entrepreneurs like James Ormond, whose family is commemorated in the city's name, came from the North, the British Islands, and the West Indies to usher in an era of agricultural development that lasted until the outbreak of the Second Seminole War in 1835 when the plantations were raised by bands of Seminoles. We can still see living reminders of that era all around us in Tomoka Park in the abundance of indigo plants growing here, descendants of one of the original cash crops of this plantation. And we can see more substantial evidence of the era and the conflict that ended it along the scenic loop drive that takes us through the heart of the plantation lands. Dummett Sugar Mill, Damietta, the Ormond Plantation, which contains the tomb of James Ormond, and farther north along the historic Old King's Highway, the most extensive remaining ruins, Bulow Plantation State Park. Another reminder of the plantation era is the Addison Blockhouse, which is also within the boundaries of Tomoka State Park, but is maintained as a cultural resource and not accessible to the public. This structure, which has been modified over the years, was built on the site of the kitchen to the manor house of John Moultrie. The property was then acquired by John Addison, who started the plantation known as Carrick Fergus in 1807. Addison died in 1825 and was buried close by. The marble slab that marked his gravesite has been relocated and preserved at Tomoka State Park where it is on display. At the outbreak of the Second Seminole War, this blockhouse was fortified with a stockade and moat and occupied by members of the Carolina Volunteer Regiment. Early in 1836, Seminoles led by the war chief Coacoochee, concealed in the woods, attacked members of the garrison as they foraged for firewood, killing three of them. The survivors retreated to the stockade and fought back against the Seminoles, who continued to fire from the nearby McRae Sugar Works and were finally driven off. These old ruins are must-see sites for the history buff, but if you choose not to take that scenic loop drive to visit the reminders of the plantation era, there's one right in the heart of the city. All we have to do is take a short drive along Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach's main east-to-west artery, and we'll come to what remains of the oldest sugar works and rum distillery in the nation. On the way, we may pass through the historic district of Ormond Beach that includes the first African-American settlements in the area known as Liberia and Sudan. This is Three Chimneys, the sugar works for a 300-acre plantation also started by Richard Oswald and known as the Swamp Settlement. The site is on state-owned property but has been restored and is managed and maintained by the Ormond Beach Historical Society which offers periodic tours of this site. A few blocks to the west of the Three Chimneys is the Pilgrim's Rest Cemetery. This is the final resting place for a number of folks, including some Civil War veterans, who lived along the Tomoka River in what was known as the Tomoka Settlement. Immediately to the east stood the Pilgrim's Rest Primitive Baptist Church, which served the settlement until a series of freezes forced the residents to move closer to town. Many of them settled along this stretch of the Old King's Road, and they brought their church building, the oldest existing structure in Ormond Beach dating from 1876, with them. The widening of Granada Boulevard forced the church to move once again, and it now sits on its own final resting place on the corner of North Beach Street and Granada at River Bridge Park where it serves as a meeting place for many local organizations. Across the street from Riverbridge Park is the elegant Greek Revival Anderson Price Building. It was built in 1915 to house the Village Improvement Association and Ormond Beach Women's Club and served as the city's library until it was replaced by a new one in 1969. 
renamed the Anderson Price Building in honor of two of Orman Beach's founders and the developers of the Hotel Orman, it is now owned and maintained by the Orman Beach Historical Society, which hosts many of its events here and also offers its facilities at a nominal fee as a venue for weddings, parties, and other private occasions. Just across the street is the headquarters of the Orman Yacht Club, dating from 1910. A few blocks to the south is the Ames House, now the office of Orman City Attorney. It was built of Tennessee stone by Robert Barker for his son in 1905, and later acquired by the Ames family, which included Civil War Union General Adelbert Ames and noted naturalist Oak Ames and his wife Blanche. Oakes was a world-renowned specialist in orchids, and Blanche was an artist who created illustrations for his books on the subject. Adjacent is Ames Park, the gardens that were designed and developed by Blanche Ames. Across the street from Ames Park is one of the few intact Native American burial mounds on Florida's east coast. It remains here through a concerted effort by a group of concerned citizens who urged the city to acquire the surrounding property to prevent development of the site. Well, that wraps it up for Ormond Beach Backstory. I hope you've enjoyed this thumbnail tour of some of the historical treasures to be found in the Ormond Beach area. We encourage you to come and see these and many more for yourself. This presentation has been brought to you by the Ormond Beach Historical Society. Our ongoing mission is to inform and educate the public about the wealth of historical treasures to be found here and to, wherever possible, restore and preserve this legacy for future generations and invite you to join us at the Historical Society, either as a member or at one of the many events the Society sponsors throughout the year. These include its annual holiday tour of homes of distinction, its acclaimed Florida Humanities Speaker Series, its regularly scheduled Historic Loop Bus Tours, its Plantation Tour, its tour of historic cemeteries, in partnership with Tomoka State Park, its Tomoka Mounds and Lost Causeway Tours, and many other special events throughout the year. Come help us make our own history together as we bring life to history, right? bringing history to life. Like us on Facebook. Visit our website at ormanhistory.org. Or drop by our office here in the historic McDonald House. If the chairs are out, we're in. I'm Steve Dahl, and thanks for watching.